26, Matthew chapter 26. We're going to be in a couple of places besides Matthew. We're going to be in Exodus, and we're going to be in the Gospel of John a little bit later on. Uh, But um, we're going to start out with Matthew 26, continuing to go through the Gospel of Matthew. We're drawing ever closer toward the conclusion of this book. And with the topic that we're talking about is uh, when Jesus uh, institutes what's called the Lord's Supper by some communion, various, it's known by various names, uh, we're going to look at when Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper and some of the things that are standing behind that. Uh, the big idea for you today is this. The Last Supper is an ordinance of Christ focusing upon His atoning death on the cross. The Last Supper is an ordinance, and I use a very specific term there that, uh, that church people, theologians, and, and all of that have used for a very long time. Uh, this is something that I will sometimes cover in our uh, membership class, for example. There are two ordinances, and that means things that Jesus Christ specifically ordained for the church to continue to practice. One of those is the practice of baptism. And one of those is the practice of what we call the Lord's Supper or communion. Uh, So Jesus Christ specifically ordains, so therefore it's called an ordinance. Uh, He ordains the Last Supper. And the Last Supper focuses upon Jesus Christ's atoning death on the cross. And atonement is the covering of our sin by the blood of Christ that is taken care of by Christ. And that in the death of Jesus Christ on the cross, our sin is imputed or transferred or counted to Christ on the cross. And he exhausts its power and strength there. And in the same moment, in in what we sometimes refer to as the great exchange, his righteousness is imputed or counted to us. Therefore, our sin is atoned for by Christ. It is paid for. It is God's wrath is satisfied by Jesus Christ's death on the cross for those who place their faith in him, those who believe. And so this is what we're going to be talking about when we talk about the Lord's Supper. But there's some significant background things that we're going to need to understand uh, as we walk through the text. So your first fill in the blank point is this, the Last Supper takes its meaning from the Passover. The Last Supper takes its meaning from the Passover, which is an Old Testament event that God commemorated or God told the the people of Israel to continuously celebrate every year. And at the time that Jesus is about to go to the cross, they're entering this time of the Passover, this very central and important celebration for the people of God since the Exodus. And so we'll actually get into the book of Exodus here in a little bit. Uh, But we're going to start with Matthew. Matthew chapter 26, verses 17 through 19. Matthew chapter 26, starting in verse 17 through 19. Now, on the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Where will you have us prepare for you to eat the Passover? So it's right there. He said, go into the city to a certain man and say to him, the teacher says, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and they prepared the Passover. So first thing. You notice the repetition of a certain word here, don't you? Three times the word Passover occurs in these short handful of verses. Now, whenever you're studying or reading the Bible and you come across what is, uh, seems to be kind of a unique-ish sort of word and it gets repeated, what the, the author of the text is trying to do is they're trying to bring something to our attention so that we will sort of sit up and take note of it. So, you know, they didn't have things like, they didn't underline the text, they didn't have italics, they didn't have bold, right? We have these different ways of highlighting or making certain things sort of stand out in a text that we read. Well, they didn't have those. So one of the main things that the ancient believers did when 
God was having them to compose the scripture, compose his word, was that certain words would get repeated. And the more something is repeated, the more significant that concept is for us to notice. So when you have a threefold repetition of a word, that means we are really, it's important for us to pay attention to its meaning. It's supposed to draw into our thinking that which is being mentioned. So we're talking about the Last Supper, or when Jesus institutes or ordains for the church to continue to practice the Last Supper, but standing behind the Last Supper is this crucial concept of the Passover, this concept of the Passover. It appears three times in three verses. We therefore ought to think about the Passover as we read this. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to the book of Exodus, chapter 12, and we're going to read verses 1 through 14. Exodus chapter 12, verses 1 through 14. It's a sizable chunk, but this is the, the, God's instructions on the Passover, some of, some of those very important instructions he gives. Exodus chapter 12, starting in verse 1. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take account of the number of persons. According to what each can eat, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. You shall take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses in which they eat. They shall eat the flesh That night, roasted on the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs, they shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted, its head with its legs and its inner parts. And you shall let none of it remain until morning. Anything that remains until morning, you shall burn. In in this manner, you shall eat it, with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And on all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord." The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be for you a memorial day. And you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. As a statute forever. You shall keep it as a So we've got this huge chunk of passage in Exodus where God is about to rescue his people from Egypt, from bondage, from slavery. And he says, this is how we're going to do it. First, get a lamb. Get a lamb. And this lamb is a sacrificial substitution. This lamb is is something that loses its life in place of the people it represents. Right? So this lamb will lose its life and its blood will be applied to the doorposts and the lintel. So you have the the, the doorposts, which are the two bits on the side, and then you have the lintel, which is the bit that is above, and the blood is applied here, and the blood is applied here, and the blood is applied here, which interestingly makes the shape of a cross. 
Interesting. So we have this sacrificial substitution that is, that is there. So a lamb for a household, and then put the blood on the doorposts and the lintel. So this is the, the first thing that we ought to notice that stands behind the Last Supper is that the Last Supper is intended to point us to a sacrificial substitution, just as the lamb was a foreshadowing of Christ as a sacrificial substitution. It's sort of a placeholder until Christ should come. Christ shows up and institutes this thing called the Last Supper. And standing behind it is the Passover because Christ is our substitute in his death for our sins. So this is the first bit where there is an interplay between what Jesus says, all right, this Last Supper thing, he doesn't call it that, because, you know, you don't go around and saying, everybody, this is my last meal. Uh, he, he intimates that at various points. He says, we're going to do this thing. And standing behind this is this Passover, this sacrificial substitution. And then in the Exodus text, it says, this is how you are going to eat the Passover. It says, you're going to do it with these. And it notes three little interesting details. First, with your belt buckled. Okay, and then with your sandals on your feet, and then lastly with your staff in your hand. Now, why the dress code? Well, what's, what's up with this? Well, that was an unusual thing. If you were in a house and you were eating a meal, even a celebratory uh, kind of a religious feast meal, you wouldn't dress like this because this is the way you would dress if you were getting ready to leave. You're getting ready to go out. So we have a sacrificial substitution with the lamb, and then we have an element of speed, or he says, eat it in haste, because you are going to be ready to get out. Now, in the Exodus, this is, you are leaving the land of Egypt. I'm taking you out of bondage. I'm taking you out of slavery. Be ready to go. When we celebrate the, the communion or the, the Lord's Supper, there is likewise to be a sort of idea of we're readiness of leaving behind that which entangles us in sin. Because that the, the deeper, bigger, truer bondage that the human race uh, experiences is a bondage to brokenness and sin and separation from God. And so in the Passover... God said to Israel, you're getting ready to go. And in the Lord's Supper, Jesus is getting ready to yank us out of sin. Be ready to leave that stuff behind. Be ready to not continue in those things. Be prepared to act on God's commands at a moment's notice. This is not, I'll have to pray about this for a while. We do that sometimes because we're trying to get out of it, right? If somebody asks us, hey, I really want you to, to, I'm thinking maybe this would be a good idea. I'll have to pray about that. It's sometimes code for thanks, but no thanks, right? When it's the command of Jesus, there is no, I'll have to pray about that. It's yes, Lord, you will command and I will obey. So Christ has commanded us to be ready to leave behind these things because he's saving us from them, which is the third part. So there's the sacrificial substitution, there's the speed for leaving, and then there's the salvation itself. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And when I strike the land of Egypt, you will not be destroyed. So in the Exodus... There's God moving in wrath and judgment among Egypt. And, and, and you'll notice that he says, I'm going to strike the firstborn. So why does he do that? Well, go back a ways in the book of Exodus, and that's precisely what Pharaoh does to the Israelites. He slaughters the firstborn sons of Israel. And now God is responding in kind, except for he's opening it up a little bit because it's not just the children firstborns that get slaughtered. It's actually adult firstborns. It's actually the firstborns among their cattle. He says, I'll show you how to do this. You think you've got me, 
No, this is the judgment that gets visited upon you. But for Israel, he says, I will look at the blood and I will pass over you. And this is what God does with us who are in Christ. He looks at those of us who have had the blood of Jesus Christ applied to us and his wrath passes over us because our our sin has been paid for. Our sin has been paid for, it's been cleansed, and he is bringing salvation. God looks at Christ's blood applied to us and his wrath passes over us because it has already been exhausted in Christ on our behalf. This is why the Last Supper is not just a sort of interesting thing we do every once in a while. It is full of meaning. It's full of Passover meaning. This is a picture of the Passover, the great Passover, where Christ passes over us for wrath and uh, and saves us instead. This is the background that we need to understand when we talk about this Passover thing and this Last Supper thing. So that's uh, Jesus talking about the Last Supper, and then we'll get to the actual practice of it in a minute. But there's something that happens in between his giving these instructions for them to go and get a place, and then actually getting together, something happens in between. Number two, Jesus reveals the traitor among them. So they get together. And Jesus springs on them that there is a traitor in their midst. There's a traitor among them. Matthew 26, verses 20 through 25. Matthew chapter 26, starting in verse 20. When it was evening, he reclined at table with the twelve. And as they were eating, he said, Truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were very sorrowful and began to say to him, to uh, one after another, Is it I, Lord? He answered, He who has dipped his hand in the dish with me will betray me. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. Judas who would betray him, answered, Is it I, Rabbi? He said to him, You have said so. So, Jesus gathers with his twelve disciples, and they're in this room having this Passover meal together, and he drops a bomb on them, an absolute atom bomb of an announcement. Truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. A normal meal, a normal meal, not even a meal like this, but even just a normal meal was a place where you would share food with somebody you considered to be a close friend. Meal sharing was not something that you did casually with people you didn't know very well. Meal sharing was something that you did with somebody that was close to you, close to you, important to you, considered trustworthy by you. And Jesus has just dropped this absolute bomb of an announcement on his disciples. One of you is a traitor. One of you is a traitor. Treachery is a serious accusation. Think about what treachery means on, like, for example, a national level for us, right? It's a capital offense. It's one of the things that you can do to gain the death penalty for. Because a traitor is somebody who should be trusted, is somebody who should be trustworthy, somebody who should be close to you, but then turns on you and 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 betrays you to a terrible fate, right? This isn't somebody, treachery is not like, you know, you weren't very nice to me. Treachery is you have plotted, you have planned, you have schemed, and you have undermined everything that I have been working for, or you've at least tried to do that. 
Now, can Judas undermine what Jesus is working for? No. Can he try? He already has. We've already read that portion of Scripture where Judas, after essentially having been called out by Jesus in the episode where there's a person who, uh, and it's Mary Magdalene, who breaks the expensive uh, oil over him, over his head, and it's on his head and on his feet, if you read a couple of different passages. And he says, well, you know, this should have been sold and given to the poor. And the text elsewhere notes that he is the one who was in charge of the money bags and he regularly helped himself to the money. He wasn't interested in the poor. He was interested in what he could get out of it, right? It was all a false front. That's more treachery. But now Jesus knows, of course, this whole time that this guy is a traitor, but he's waiting till they're all together at this crucial moment of this Last Supper, celebrating this Passover, to then wait until he announces, by the way, one of you has been working against me. One of you is a traitor to the cause. And so a normal meal was a place of friendship, but this is beyond even that. This is a sacred setting. And it's in the midst of this sacred setting that Jesus reveals that Judas is a traitor to the cause. And then Jesus says this interesting thing. He says, the Son of Man goes as it is written, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. So let's take, there's two phrases there. Son of Man goes as it is written. What he says is, here's what I'm doing. I am doing according to what God has already said from before the foundation of the world. According to what is written is, this, the scriptures have promised that this was going to happen. This is foreordained by God. God has planned this from even before there was man and woman on the earth. Before there even was an earth. God planned this because the word is eternal and unchangeable. All right, the scriptures actually will, will tell us elsewhere that this was planned from before the foundation of the world. So Jesus says the Son of Man goes according to as it is written. This is always how it was going to be. It's foreordained by God. It's promised by God. And it's now coming true according to that. Jesus highlights the divine ordination of the betrayal of Judas. God is not surprised that Judas betrayed Jesus. God planned it to happen that way. Now, we have that side of things, the ordination side of things, but there's another side of things that also get mentioned here. So there's the Son of Man goes out as it is written, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. So there's also the personal responsibility of the traitor. Even though this is ordained of God, Judas bears personal responsibility. Do you know why? Because he still chose to do it. This is still a choice that Judas made. The the sovereignty and ordination of God does not negate human responsibility. We still make choices. And, and, And how do we make choices? We make choices absolutely according to our nature. We act as we are. We act as we are. Judas is doing exactly with what is in line with his character and his nature. He is simply being Judas in this moment, in this moment of treachery, in this moment of going to the high priest and selling Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. It was ordained of God, but it was also an act according to that's what Judas is. This is who he is like. And there's sometimes like, well, how does this all work and interplay with one another? The problem is, is that it can be a bit of a mystery And we don't see all of the details. And the scripture says things like in Deuteronomy, the secret things belong to God, but the things that are revealed are for us and for our children. There are things that God keeps to himself. He keeps his own counsel on how things work out. He keeps his own counsel on how he sovereignly governs and ordains how the universe will be. 
and, and he doesn't always tell us. He tells us some things. We, we have a whole huge book of things that he has told us. But I don't think we have the capacity to understand how he can ordain something and how can we can be fully responsible for our choices as well. But it is that way. This is how the scripture lays it out for us. So we have this moment then after Jesus has said this where Judas, well, actually all of the disciples say, well, is it me? They don't seem to know if it's them or not. Do you notice that? They, they're like, oh, no, <laughs> I, I hope it's not me. They don't seem to have an understanding. They're like, well, maybe I will betray him. Maybe this is going to be my fault. And they're a little, they're a little scared at this point. And finally, it comes to Judas, and Judas says, is it me, Lord? And I'll tell you this much. We've already seen that Judas knows it's him. He's gone to the priests by this point. He's received the 30 pieces of silver by this point. Judas knows it's him. All right? This is more lying, covering up kinds of activity on Judas's part. He's maybe even hoping that Jesus doesn't know it's him. Maybe he's like, well, maybe Jesus isn't aware that it's me. There are certain other things he doesn't seem to know. Maybe this is one of those. But Jesus looks right at him and says, yep, you. Do you can you imagine being Judas in that moment where the master looks in your eyes, the creator of the universe stares into your soul and pronounces you a traitor. What must that have been like? Well, we know one thing for sure, that by the end of Judas' life, which is not long after this point, he, he, he can't take it. It's too much for him. He goes and he, he kills himself. He hangs himself. And apparently his insides spill out. If you read the book of Acts, which is like, oh, he's not very good at hanging himself, apparently. But he can't take it. It's too much for him. And he just goes off the rails completely. That because he's just had the creator of the universe stare into his face and said, it's you, traitor. You're the traitor. And that undoes him. It absolutely undoes him, as, yeah, it would. Matthew has established that Judas, of course, already knows. He says what the others say, perhaps treacherously testing Jesus, but Jesus will not be fooled. And he's not fooled by anything. He, he, he never is. He never has been. Jesus cannot be tricked. Jesus cannot be goaded into making a false choice. Jesus is absolutely authoritatively trustworthy to do that which is right. And that includes calling out the traitors. And, and Jesus says, he's already said elsewhere, there's not just one person that's a traitor. He said in Matthew chapter 7 early on, there are wolves in sheep's clothing. You will know them, plural, by their fruit. You will know them by their fruit. There are many. John, uh, in some of his writings, in the, the, the three short epistles he sends, one of them he says, you, you have heard that Antichrist in, is in the world, and there are many Antichrists. W you know, with the whole Antichrist thing, we totally usually imagine there's this one nasty figure that's going to show up. John says, there's lots of them. There are many who are against Christ. That's what Antichrist means. Judas is one of them. And this goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. In the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve take the fruit and God pronounces the judgment over them, he says to the woman and to the serpent, there's going to be hostility between you two. And between woman, your seed, 
Christ, and then he says to the serpent, and to your seed. Well, who's the seed of the serpent? All of those who come after the serpent, who live like the serpent in deception and treachery. Why does John call the people who come to the baptism that he's doing in the wilderness, you brood of vipers. He's identifying them as the seed of the serpent from Genesis chapter 3. They are those who are against the way that God is doing things, and they're instead following, as Jesus will later call some of them, your father the devil. There are traitors. There always have been traitors. In Acts chapter 20, John, uh, uh, Paul, as he is leaving and departing from the elders uh, in Ephesus, and he says to them, I know that after I leave, fierce and ravenous wolves will come up from within you. There will always be this danger of traitors from within. Pay attention to that, he says, and deal with it when it shows up. And deal with it when he shows up or they show up. Number three, Jesus then reveals he is to be the true Passover sacrifice. Jesus reveals that he is to be the true Passover sacrifice. Judas leaves by this point, and Jesus celebrates with the remaining 11 this Lord's Supper, the Last Supper. Matthew chapter 26, verses 26 through 29. Now, as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it, and gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins." I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. So Jesus, with this moment where he's instituting or ordaining what we know of as the Last Supper, he's taking all of this Exodus uh, Passover material and incorporating it into it because they're doing it at a Passover celebration. And he says to, about the bread, here's the bread, take, eat it, this is my body, as the Passover lamb was consumed, so too was Christ to be consumed. Eating the bread is symbolic of partaking in Jesus' death. Eating of the bread symbolizes partaking in Jesus' death. And we'll, there's a, John will actually talk about this in, in uh, just a minute. We'll get into the Gospel of John here. But that's what we're meant to see, that, that when we do the the celebration of the Lord's Supper together. And when we eat that little wafer, that is, the, you know, the, he broke it and we eat it, that's the, the, I am saying Christ died for me and I am taking that into myself. I am taking that into myself. Take, eat, this is my body. And then after that, he takes a cup and he says, all right, all of you drink from it, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. In the Passover, the applied blood on the doorpost and lintel was the sign that God observed in order to pass over the household that dwelt in it that participated in the Passover, right? They took the blood, they applied it to the outside of the house. Something is slightly tweaked here. It's the same basic image, but it's hyper-magnified in a way, and it's applied slightly differently. Right? So God observed the household, passed over it with his wrath. Here, the blood isn't applied to the exterior of a building, but symbolically to the interior of a person. You take it inside yourself. Because as Jesus has preached and as Jesus has taught, the thing that needs to be changed is not the exterior, but the heart. And this is right in line with what the Old Testament's like Ezekiel taught about. 
in Ezekiel chapter 11 and Ezekiel chapter 36, where there's a promise of, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. I will take your heart of stone out from you and I will put in you a heart of flesh. Stone is a hard, unresponsive thing. Flesh is something that responds to the touch. And this is the picture that Ezekiel puts out and that Jesus is directly in line with is that there is something new happening. But to get there, you have to apply the blood inside. You have to apply the blood on the inside. John chapter 6, verses 47 through 59. John chapter 6, verses 47 through 59. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat of the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. As the living Father sent me and I live because the Father uh, because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Jesus said these things in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. So we have this interesting passage where Jesus is talking about himself as bread and, his, and, and people eating the bread and drinking his blood, which is probably why some of the early Romans looked at Christians and thought we were cannibals. That was actually an accusation against early Christianity. These people are eating people. That's what they thought. Some of them thought that. And so that caused us a little bit of trouble at one point. But you have to understand what he's not talking about is actually going and munching on somebody's arm. He's talking about something different. And he actually explains it in the very first verse of this passage we read. How does one feed on the flesh and blood of Jesus? Verse 47, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. Belief is the mechanism of feeding. Belief is the mechanism of the feeding. The true eating and drinking is the possession and exercising of faith in Christ. Participating in the Lord's Supper is the obedient outward symbol of that inward expression of faith. When you believe in Christ truly, That blood is applied inside, that body is participated in, and you are saved. And we obediently then practice the outward expression that he gave us that we will sometimes call communion or the Lord's Supper. And then Jesus says, I will not drink again until the day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. The symbolic meal was to be practiced in perpetuity. We're to keep on doing this. So this is why, you know, in other texts where, the, where we look at the institution of the Lord's Supper, he says things like, do this as often you drink it or eat it in remembrance of me. Like, keep doing this is the idea. It's, it's a continue practicing this together. So that symbolic meal is to be practiced in perpetuity. Jesus confirms his impending death by stating that he will no longer be eating it until later. I'll no longer drink of this wine until a later date. Why, Jesus? You've just told us to continue doing it. Why aren't you going to do it? Well, he's not going to do it because he's going to die. 
He's going to die. He's going to be buried. He's going to be raised. And then he's going to heaven. He takes up the throne in heaven. And so uh, it, there, he's not participating in that outward symbol because he's the point of the symbol. He's the whole point of why we do what we do with the elements of the Last Supper. So this is who we are. We are people who celebrate the Passover when Jesus passed over us. By going to the cross, he passed over us in wrath by taking the wrath of God upon himself. And God passes over us with his wrath because he looks at you and me who believe and he is satisfied with the applied blood of Jesus Christ and the broken body that is partaken of in Christ by faith. This is why we do what we do. And it's important that we be reminded of this so that it's not just an action that we do every once in a while, like, oh yeah, I guess it's communion day. So let's do the communion thing. Because sometimes the the multiple practicing of something can become stale in our minds and become thoughtless. But we are not to be thoughtless on this. We are to think about it as we do it. So in a little bit here, in a moment, when we together practice communion with one another, the Lord's Supper, the Last Supper, with each element, I implore you, Think about the meaning of it as it is between your teeth. Think about the body of Jesus being broken, being whipped, being abused, being punched, being his beard ripped out, being jeered by the crowd, being striped on his back so that it hardly resembled a human back anymore. And the thorns, the inch-long, hard-as-nailed Judean thorns shoved onto his head. Think about that as we participate in communion together. Don't let it be just a sort of thoughtless action. Let it be something that you actually consider as we go through it.